Tēnē koutou, tēnē tātou katoa. Welcome, everybody, to Victoria University and the first sustainable lectures series. Uh, my name is Marianne Vandenmeld. I am the, uh, the new Assistant Vice-Chancellor on Sustainability since almost two months. Um, and I'm in, in charge of setting up this Penn University office on sustainability, which is really exciting. It's the only uh, university that even in New Zealand that even has an ABC level on sustainability. So we're very excited about that. Uh, that demonstrates quite a bit of um, leadership on behalf of, uh, of Victoria <coughs> University and a very strong commitment to, um, to sustainability. The university has already done a lot of amazing work. It was, for example, the first university to start divesting uh, from fossil fuels. It also has a great track record on reducing its waste, its energy, and its water, etc. So, Victoria University is a global civic university, I think in the coolest capital city in the world. Um, and the sustainability office will try to take the already great efforts to the next level both becoming a more sustainable university as well as a university that wants to contribute to sustainable development. Yeah? And that's, that's really important. So, as I said, first lecture series, very happy to have uh, uh, Professor Robert Costanza. We'll be talking on natural capital and ecosystem services. Um, I believe in that sense we're on the brink of something that can flip in New Zealand from uh, in the space of natural capital and ecosystem services. I uh, have recently been elected onto the board of um, the Sustainable Business Council and you see the companies are starting to use that concept of ecosystem services to analyze their risks and the opportunities across the, uh, the various sectors. The regional councils uh, are obviously doing great work in that area if only we now can get the politics around it. Um, to, to accept those concepts as well. National government has been thinking about this uh, across the departments in the natural resource sectors for a few years as well. The university has a lot to offer in terms of bringing those concepts together. And so I think we're on the brink of something really great. And I'm hoping that Professor Costanzo can inspire us to take that next leap um, and share his, uh, his extensive uh, wisdom in this space. So, Robert Costanza is the Professor and Chair in Public Policy at the Crawford, uh, Crawford School of Policy, Public Policy at uh, Australian Nas National University in Canberra. Prior to that, he was a Distinguished University Professor in Sustainability in the Institute of Sustainable Solutions Portland University, Portland State University. And prior to that, Director and Professor at the Gund Institute for Ecological Economics at the University of Vermont in the United States. A true interdisciplinarian, Professor Costanza received a BA and MA degrees in architecture and a PhD in environmental engineering and uh, engineering sciences, particularly systems ecology. That was from the University of Florida. And then he took economics as a foreign language. Dr. Costanza also co-founded the, uh, and was president for a period of time, the International Society for Ecological Economics. Um, that's where we met in uh, 1992. Currently, on the, he is on 10 editorial boards um, uh, of various international academic uh, journals. He is also the founding editor in chief of, of uh, Solutions, which you might want to pass out so people can take a good, good look at it. It's a very unique, hybrid, academic, popular journal that uh, you can take a look at. And then he is also the author or co-author of over 500 scientific papers, 27 books. His work has been cited in, in more than 17,000 scientific articles. He's given over 300 interviews um, and his work appears in various popular media as well. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Professor, uh, Robert Costanza. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Thanks, Marianne, for that kind introduction. Um, <clears throat> let's see. 
So things have changed on, on the Earth recently. You've probably heard the term Anthropocene. Who's heard the term Anthropocene before? OK, so we have an informed audience. You know that we don't live in an empty world any longer. We live in a world that's, that's full of humans and their influence. And that means that business as usual is no longer an option. As uh, Paul Raskin has said, it's, uh, business as usual is the utopian fantasy. Uh, we have to make a transformation into a, a more sustainable and desirable future if we want to uh, <clears throat> maintain our presence here on, on planet Earth in a, in a desirable way. Um, we know that we have exceeded several planetary boundaries. You've probably seen some version of this, this uh, diagram as well, um, <clears throat> where a large group of us got together and tried to establish, you know, where, where is the safe operating space in terms of the, the fundamental ecological constraints on, on planet Earth. And we recognize that at least three of them are probably already outside the safe operating space, climate change, biodiversity loss, and the nitrogen cycle, and several others rapidly approaching uh, the, the safe boundaries. Everybody here? Are you good? No? Um, I don't know which microphone to get closer to. <laughs> How about that one? How's that? OK. Um, <clears throat> so however, framing the, the issue in that way, uh, these are certainly uh, truths, but they're very inconvenient truths. This is not the movie that most people are lining up to go see. Uh, so I think the problem here is partly how we, how we frame uh, the issues about the future. Um, that, in fact, we need a third movie. Uh, we need a movie that's a much more positive vision of a sustainable and desirable economy in society, in nature. And I put it in those terms just to emphasize the fact that we need to re-envision <clears throat> what the economy is. It's not this isolated thing uh, that's separate from the rest of nature or so from society. It's, it's, a, uh, it's completely embedded in uh, the rest of society, the rest the rest of the natural world. So <clears throat> I think going forward, if our goals are to create this sustainable and desirable future, uh, we have to start with that, that changing vision. We have to recognize that, yes, there are planetary boundaries uh, that we need to maintain, but we also have the elements of well-being and quality of life uh, you know, within those boundaries uh, that we have to, to build and maintain, what Kate Rayworth has called the, uh, the donut. Uh, so we have a, uh, a sort of planetary ceiling, but a social floor that we have to uh, live within. So that, I think, is our ongoing challenge. How do we create this sustainable and desirable uh, future that, that combines those different elements, uh, sustainable scale, and, and, uh, but also high quality of life? Um, there have been some significant movements, I think, in a positive direction around this. You've probably all heard about the, um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, that recognize that our, our goals are, uh, are much broader, and these goals apply to all countries, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which were really directed at, quote, unquote, developing countries. Uh, these goals apply to all countries. Um, <clears throat> and you can see from this list, you know, they include things like uh, gender and general uh, inequality or equality. Um, they include uh, action on climate. They include... Um, <clears throat> Uh, maintaining uh, both marine and terrestrial uh, resources, reducing poverty, uh, you know, moving towards renewable energy. Um, economic growth is included, but it's, it's, uh, it's modified as inclusive and sustainable uh, economic growth. So what, do, what does that mean? So there's a much broader uh, set of goals, I think, that all countries, including New Zealand, have signed on to. Uh, the question is, you know, what, what do these goals mean? And I think... Um, <clears throat> One important aspect is that all of these goals are not independent from each other. They're all interconnected. Uh, there, there are many trade-offs and, and synergies uh, among these different goals. And it's important to recognize that they all uh, ultimately contribute to an overarching goal of a prosperous, high quality of life that's equitably shared and sustainable. I think there's growing consensus that that's what we're really after uh, going forward. Uh, that to achieve that, we need to have a sustainable scale of the, of the economy uh, within, the, within society and the life support system, uh, within planetary boundaries. We need a fair distribution of resources, both within the current generation of humans, but also between current and future generations, and between humans and other species. And we need an efficient allocation of resources, um, but that 
allocation needs to include recognition of the value of natural capital and ecosystem services and the value of social capital, um, et cetera. So it's a, it's a complex system process. And I think um, creating this and achieving this overarching goal is going to require that we better understand how this whole system functions uh, in, a, in, a, in a better way. So I'll focus today on natural capital and ecosystem services and their contribution to sustainable well-being, but recognizing that these other aspects are, are, are also important. Um, you've probably heard about or seen the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. This is their uh, version of the, the list of these services, which they uh, aggregate into these four basic categories of provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services. Who's, who's seen this before? So, okay, almost many of you. Um, and how they contribute to the various constituents of human uh, well-being. Let's go much beyond simply more consumption uh, to, uh, you know, health, good social relations, security, et cetera. Um, you know, all the benefits that people derive from functioning ecosystems, from natural capital. Um, there is something missing from this diagram, I, I think, though, and that's the interaction with the other forms of capital. Uh, so I think it's, this is maybe a clearer picture of what's, what we're talking about, um, <clears throat> that our goal is sustainable well-being, that these four basic types of capital assets are all required uh, in some more balanced way to, cr to produce that, that well-being. Natural capital doesn't just flow into, into well-being. Uh, it requires built human capital, individual people, built infrastructure, social capital, our societies, uh, and some more balanced interaction to create sustainable well-being. And what we're talking about when we talk about the value of natural capital and ecosystem services is what's their contribution in this, in this interaction uh, to sustainable uh, human well-being. Uh, so it's not all about markets, uh, but markets are one institution that's, that's there to, to, uh, to, to, to allocate these resources, but certainly not the only one or the most appropriate one in many cases. Um, there's been a lot of... <clears throat> um, Traction, I think, recently on this idea of ecosystem services. You may have heard of the IPBES, an intergovernmental panel on uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services, which is sort of equivalent to the IPCC um, in, in, uh, on talking about these, these issues. Uh, so this will do ongoing assessments of ecosystem services uh, globally uh, and is, a, is uh, participated in by uh, almost all countries. There's the Ecosystem Services Partnership, uh, which you may be aware of. Take a look at this website if you want to see you know, who's, who's doing what in this area around the world. This is a large membership organization, but it includes both academics and uh, practitioners and policy, and policy people. Um, <clears throat> this is an interesting memo that uh, was released recently, last October, by the Obama administration, uh, requiring all... Um, U.S. federal agencies to incorporate ecosystem services into their, uh, their decision making. Uh, so it's beginning to affect um, that sort of level of, of policy making in the United States. The EU has a, um, a similar kind of directive, uh, the Biodiversity Strategy uh, Directive, uh, that recognizes <clears throat> the value of natural capital and the need uh, in Target 2 to maintain and restore ecosystems and their, and their services. Uh, so there are several initiatives that are, that are uh, headed in the right direction. Um, this is an interesting one. <clears throat> uh, Ken Henry, who is the former treasurer of Australia, who's now the chair of the uh, National Australia Bank, uh, gave a, a, uh, an address recently uh, <clears throat> emphasizing that uh, natural capital is not a footnote in the business plan. It's a core asset of the balance sheet, and that's true for individual businesses, and it's also true for the, uh, for the nation. So... Uh, NAB is actively involved in uh, trying to put natural capital, you know, on the balance sheet. And I think this sort of thing could have some real uh, influence on people's decision making. If banks begin to uh, adjust their loans, who they loan to, what their interest rates are based on how well uh, businesses and farmers are, are maintaining their natural capital assets as well as their other assets, uh, that could have a real influence on people's, uh, people's behavior going forward. So if you look at the NAB website, <clears throat> it looks something like this. They have a whole, a whole section on natural value, what it is, and, uh, and how they hope to, to um, uh, encourage and maintain it. So <clears throat> the idea of valuing these services in, in a range of different ways 
uh, how do we how do we assess how much they're contributing uh, to human well-being and sustainable well-being? Well, there's a, a range of uses uh, for those values, including simply raising awareness and interest, just, just sort of making it clear that that ecosystems are not just a pretty picture, but they're actually supporting almost everything that we do in life. Um, <clears throat> adjusting national income and well-being accounts, I think, is another uh, major effort. How do we get beyond um, this sort of misplaced emphasis on GDP growth as our primary policy goal, and how do we make sure that, that uh, uh, the value of natural capital, social capital, and other things are incorporated into our, um, <clears throat> our overall uh, national goals. We can use um, these valuations for specific policy analyses uh, for urban and regional land use planning. How do we create landscapes that actually uh, maximize the value of the whole landscape um, this idea of payment for ecosystem services, how can we reward uh, individuals and, and, and others for uh, enhancing and, and, uh, and preserving those services? Full cost accounting, <clears throat> um, how do we get the prices right? How do we uh, <clears throat> uh, get the market to, to stop telling us, uh, to start telling us the truth about the full cost of what we're, we're producing and consuming? I'll say a little bit more about that. And how do we create better institutions for managing these services, which are in large part public goods and not amenable to, um, to being dealt with in private markets. Um, this is an interesting paper I ran across uh, that asked a, uh, a group of 80 uh, different um, managers, marine, uh, Australian coastal and marine managers. Uh, they asked them, uh, <clears throat> how important was this issue of valuation uh, to this range of different uh, ecosystem services? Uh, on, a, on a scale from zero to 100 percent. You can see that most of them thought that uh, the, these, this, that valuation was either important, uh, high or medium importance to, to uh, almost all of these, uh, these ecosystem services. Um, <clears throat> compare that, however, with their trust in the estimates of the value of these ecosystem services, which was uh, a little bit lower, higher in some cases, but uh, you know, not, not as high in, in other cases. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of uh, the research behind estimating what these, res res uh, these resources are worth, how they interact with <clears throat> human well-being and sustainability. There's been, there has been a lot of um, growth in the academic um, area and uh, the number of research articles published on this topic of ecosystem services. Uh, this is just from, uh, from Scopus. Uh, over time, um, from you know back in 1985, which is kind of the first mention of the term, I think, in the scientific literature, uh, up until the present, there are now more than 2,000 articles a year published on this on this topic area. So a lot of a lot of scientific research uh, going on. Um, <clears throat> the most highly cited of those papers is this one that and you might recognize a few names here. Uh, so Marianne and I, uh, together with this large group of authors, uh, met at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in Santa Barbara in 1996 and tried to synthesize all of the work that had been done <clears throat> up until that point on this issue of valuation of ecosystem services. Um, and so uh, we came up with an estimate based on that at 17 different services across 16 different biomes, several hundred papers that we, that we put together and came up with an estimate of around $33 trillion a year, uh, significantly larger than global GDP at the time. Um, this paper has been cited many more times than I ever expected it to be, certainly at the time. Um, one thing we didn't control was what they put on the cover of the, the magazine, and they said pricing the planet. We didn't really mean pricing. We meant valuing uh, the planet, because I think there is a clear distinction there between <clears throat> prices in markets and that this value as assuming that these are exchange values. And most of it uh, is outside the market. That's the whole point, uh, that, that many of these, <clears throat> these systems are providing contributions to well-being that, that are not marketed, probably should not be marketed. Uh, but are ne nevertheless uh, extremely valuable, more valuable in total uh, than all of the stuff that is marketed in, in, uh, in GDP. Um, so it's been, I put this one in, <clears throat> it's not, just to give you an idea of where this paper stands in the scheme of all, all papers uh, published and included in the ISI uh, web of science. Uh, and this is from this article that came out recently where they looked at the top 100 most cited papers 
and the top 10 most cited papers. The top one was cited like 300,000 times. But this little diagram here shows you the stack. If you stacked up the first pages of all the papers that are included in the ISI database, it would reach almost to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, <clears throat> about half of them are never cited. Uh, the next, this part were cited between one and 10 times, uh, et cetera, all the way up to here. This stack here is the top meter and a half, I think, of ones that were cited more than a thousand times. And <clears throat> um, our paper, uh, was about here, about 6,200 citations so far in, uh, in ISI. So it's been cited more times than the Watson and Crick paper about, about uh, DNA and several other papers that you might, uh, you might think are important. I put this up just to show the, the level of sort of academic interest in, in, uh, in this issue uh, going forward. Um, so <clears throat> more recently, uh, as part of the TEEB study, the, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, which was funded by the Deutsche Bank and uh, UNEP, um, <clears throat> there was a, um, an update uh, assessment of the value of these uh, various services over uh, these different biomes. Um, and this is just a summary diagram uh, showing you by, by biome, the sort of range of values uh, that, uh, that you get out. You can see that some systems like coral reefs are extremely valuable per hectare. This is in dollars per hectare per year. Uh, even though there's a large range of, of these values, uh, the mean values are, are, uh, are, are pretty, pretty high. And again, I'm not claiming that these are very precise estimates, uh, but these estimates do indicate uh, that this contribution is, is large. Um, <clears throat> more recently, we tried to uh, assess, well, what has changed since in that time period between 1997 and uh, 2011, in this case, uh, in terms of the value of those services. And um, uh, <clears throat> we estimated that because of land use change, largely, largely the, the, um, <clears throat> the estimates of the value have increased. Uh, but because of land use change, um, uh, per hectare anyway, because of land use change, um, the total value, the total contribution has gone down by around 20 uh, trillion dollars a year. So we've, there's been desertification, there's been loss of coral reefs, uh, there's been depletion of, of, uh, of many of the, the more valuable systems or conversion into to less valuable uh, ecosystems. Um, <clears throat> I know you probably can't read this, but just to give you an idea of how we did that, we just looked at how land use had changed over that time period, how the unit values have changed, and, and there has been all of that additional research in general that has showed that the estimates of the value have increased. All the green numbers go up. The red values don't go down by very much from these, these estimates. Um, <clears throat> and then you can, you can differentiate uh, by updating the 1997 values uh, to 45 trillion is what it would be in, in uh, 2007 dollars. Um, what happens if you change only the unit values? Uh, then there was a significant increase. We underestimated uh, by quite a bit. Uh, if you use the new unit values, if you change only the land area, you get this number. So the difference between this one and that one is 4.3 trillion. Uh, if you change both, you get the difference between this total and this total, or 20 trillion or so. So, again, an estimate. <clears throat> Question is, uh, going forward, what do we do about that? Uh, we're sort of on a downward trend with uh, the value of ecosystem services. If we want to create this sustainable and desirable future, uh, we have to uh, change our policies. Uh, so as part of uh, a project called the Economics of Land Degradation, we looked at a series of future scenarios. In this case, scenarios done by the Great Transition Initiative. And they broke the, uh, they had four uh, scenarios that they looked at. Market forces is kind of business as usual. The Great Transition is, um, I would say, similar to if we actually uh, achieved all of the sustainable development goals. Policy reform is, is uh, more government planning, but it's still a focus on GDP growth. And Fortress World is kind of the collapse scenario. Um, <clears throat> here's a description of those. And you can go onto the GTI website, and they have a very elaborate um, website that describes these four scenarios. I won't go into details here. Um, but they also had some projections of land use going forward out to the year 2050. Uh, for each of these scenarios. So we took uh, those land use projections <clears throat> uh, for each of the four scenarios I mentioned. Um, and we're able to map those uh, globally. Um, and you can see the current uh, land use description, uh, the four different scenarios. I know it's quite dif difficult to see the differences at, at uh, this scale. 
Uh, but there are significant differences, particularly if you look at, for example, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, well, let's see, desertification in Australia uh, and other parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> that led to a, these projections of the future of ecosystem services, uh, a decline from 1997 to 2011 uh, under the fortress world and, uh, and uh, market forces scenarios, a continuing decline. Uh, you could stabilize the value of those resources with a policy reform scenario, but it's also possible with the great transition to reverse that trend and, and uh, <clears throat> restore the value of those services going forward uh, out to 2050. And again, I emphasize that the sustainable development goals, if implemented, would be fairly similar, I think, to that transition. Here's what it would look like in terms of percent changes from the 2011 values of ecosystem services under those four different scenarios. Um, so it varies a bit by country, depending on what land uses are involved. Uh, but <clears throat> in general, uh, a, a positive trend, a, a very positive trend under the Great Transition, sort of mixed under policy reform, uh, and definitely negative under the other two. So <clears throat> we know um, from, other, from other data that when we make these land use transitions, uh, there are, uh, there's often a net loss in the value of ecosystem services. This again is from the Millennium Assessment. Uh, when you convert from intact wetlands to intensive farming, <clears throat> you're um, improving perhaps the private benefits, but the social benefits are, are uh, decreased significantly by more than half. Likewise for other land use transitions. Um, a few years ago, we looked at the, um, <clears throat> a scenario, a, a, uh, an assessment uh, at the global scale of the benefit cost ratio of conserving our, our natural capital. And this one was based on a scenario of increasing the global um, reserve network to cover 15% of the terrestrial biosphere, 30% of the marine biosphere. That would cost, under this scenario, about 45 billion a year. Uh, but the benefits would be the net, the difference in value between the intact system and what, what it might be converted to of about four to five trillion dollars a year. So a benefit cost ratio of on the order of 100 to one. And so other subsequent studies have showed similar kinds of benefit cost ratios of investing in uh, preserving our, our natural capital assets. Much better returns, I would say, than, than uh, most other things you could think of investing your money in these days. The only other better investment I could find was uh, oil companies investing in political campaigns in the United States, <laughs> which is about 400 to one, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, in terms of full cost accounting, uh, you may have heard of this company called True Cost uh, that I've been involved with that, that tries to do just that. They assess the, the, the full cost uh, by company, uh, the external cost of their, uh, their activities, not just their, the company's activities itself, but also their suppliers' activities and their suppliers' suppliers, so all the way down the supply chain. Uh, what are the environmental and health costs associated with companies' operations? Um, and they found, found in a recent study that um, probably more than half of companies in the world are really not producing a social profit. They're just calling uh, their environmental costs uh, profit. Uh, so they're not actually uh, doing anything of benefit to society in the long term. So how do we get that <clears throat> information into the, uh, into the decision making system uh, and, do a real, uh, and do a better job of full cost accounting? Ultimately, I think we need to do a much better job of modeling and um, <clears throat> the, the, the dynamics and, and the spatial performance of ecosystem services. And there's a lot of work going on now on how to do that. Uh, this is just one example of a, a system that we've been working on uh, that tries to integrate across at, at, at multiple spatial scales uh, this whole range of um, components and do an integrated uh, systems modeling approach, multi-scale integrated models of ecosystem services, we, we call it. Um, and <clears throat> I think we can go beyond that, actually, and try to, to use these underlying landscape models as the basis for interactive uh, games that people can play. Who's played Pokemon Go so far? <clears throat> I've heard that um, Currently, we spend about three billion hours a week playing computer games of various kinds. Um, so <clears throat> how can we use that, uh, or at least part of that time, uh, to actually do something a little more productive um, and to, uh, to build what you might call integrated games uh, that combine both entertainment, research, and education? 
Um, so <clears throat> there's been a lot of work, you know, on game theory and using games in, in, th in that sense. Uh, there's certainly a lot of uh, use of, of games for entertainment and for, for education. Uh, but I think we can put all three of those together. If we've had a, a, uh, you know, a simulation model of a landscape, <clears throat> uh, we can actually keep track of all of the decisions that people make when they're playing that game and begin to understand how they understand and how they value uh, different components, ecosystem services uh, in the system. So you can use it for uh, <clears throat> creating, um, uh, for understanding valuation of, of ecosystem services and also for educating people about what those services are. <clears throat> um, so I think that's uh, going forward. Hang on. And finally, on the issue of uh, <clears throat> integrating these elements into national income accounting. Um, I think it's well beyond time to uh, leave uh, GDP behind as our major policy goal at the national level. Uh, GDP was never designed for that purpose. Uh, it's really a very specialized measure of production and consumption in the, uh, in the economy. Um, <clears throat> it has a lot of problems when you try to you know, use it for uh, the purpose of, of uh, a national policy goal. Um, there are a lot of things left out of GDP. There are a lot of things included that probably that probably shouldn't be. If there's more oil spills, you know, somebody has to go clean that up. There's going to be increased GDP. We don't want more oil spills. We don't want more crime. Uh, we don't want more uh, pollution. Uh, but all of those things are are included. Um, and um, so there has been a, a a lot of effort, I think, in recent times uh, to create alternatives uh, to GDP. Um, and I'll just talk about a few of them. Um, this paper uh, looked at just some, a subset that you can divide into these three basic categories. One is our indicators that, that modify uh, GDP in some way uh, that are in, uh, denominated in, in dollar units. And I'll talk a little bit more about the genuine progress indicator. <clears throat> There's a group uh, that, um, that are based on surveys of subjective well-being. Uh, the World Value Survey is probably the best known one of those. Uh, Bhutan has been using something called the, the uh, Gross National Happiness uh, Index. So you can ask, ask people, you know, how satisfied are they with their life? And then there's a whole range of indicators that are built up from um, different indicators that are, that are either weighted or unweighted and go into an overall index. Uh, the Human Development Index from the UN the Happy Planet Index, the uh, uh, OECD's Better Life Index is a more is a, uh, a recent one that's kind of interesting. Uh, so there's been a range of things going on there. <clears throat> this is from the World Happiness Report that just came out. So this is based on life satisfaction scores across different countries. Uh, you probably can't read any of the names of the countries here. Uh, this is all all 157 countries in the world, uh, starting with anybody want to guess with the most uh, the happiest country in the world, according to this? <clears throat> Denmark. Denmark, Switzerland, Iceland, Norway, Finland, Canada, a lot of Scandinavian countries. Netherlands is seven. Uh, New Zealand comes out very pretty well on this. They're number eight, uh, just above Australia. Uh, but well above uh, the United Kingdom and the United States are well down the list, uh, et cetera. So, um, what was interesting about this was they also tried to explain <clears throat> the variation in these world happiness scores and the, the amount that's explained by GDP is really a relatively minor uh, component. Uh, so there are other components that are about social support, about uh, <clears throat> life expectancy, about, so about health, social capital. Uh, not really a lot about natural capital or ecosystem services, but this blue area is all the unexplained variations. So I think that's, that's something that needs to be included. Um, we know from other research that if you plot GDP per capita versus mean life satisfaction in these surveys, you get graphs that look like this, where there's, there's a <clears throat> rapid increase at first, uh, but beyond a certain point, there's really not much more improvement in life satisfaction as GDP per capita goes up. Uh, Costa Rica is just as happy as the United States uh, with a third of the, the GP, GDP per capita. <clears throat> um, this is the OECD Better Life Index, um, and I would direct you to this website, which is, which is very nicely done, uh, where they have these 11 different indicators. They start out weighting them all the same, uh, but you can adjust that on the website. So you can say, well, if I, if I think that environment is much more important, uh, you can change that weight, and you can see how that changes the rankings of the, the OECD countries, at least. 
<clears throat> on this one, Australia comes out uh, on, the, on the top of the heap, uh, at least with, with equal weightings, followed by Scandinavia and New Zealand is way down, way, not way down here, but down here. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, if, uh, if you look at uh, regions and cities, Canberra came out to be you know, the best uh, city in the world, according to the OECD Better Life Index. So that, I don't know if that validates or invalidates the, the rankings. <laughs> um, anyway, it's pretty interesting. And what they're doing is collecting people's responses here. So they're looking at how people weight these different uh, elements. And they're collecting all of that to see you know, what the, how people weight, weight things and can use that to adjust them. <clears throat> but let me say a little bit more about the genuine progress indicator, which is one that uh, at least can go back historically and look at trends over time, uh, back, to the, back to the 50s at least. Um, this is a version of the Index of Sustainable Economic uh, Welfare, which was created by Herman Daly and John Cobb back in 1989. It starts with personal consumption expenditures, which are a major component of GDP, but then it weights them by income distribution, uh, just to recognize that a dollar's worth of income to a rich person doesn't produce as much welfare at well-being as a dollar's worth of income to a poor person. GDP doesn't care about distribution. You know, so if Donald Trump made all the GDP in the country, it would be exactly the same as if that were equally distributed among all the, the entire population. Um, it <clears throat> adds a few things that are left out, like household labor and volunteer work, uh, good things, but are not marketed, so they're not included in GDP. It subtracts a bunch of things that probably shouldn't be counted as pluses. Uh, the loss of leisure time, the cost of uh, crime, auto accidents, family breakdown. You know, one way to increase GDP is to get a divorce. You know, so then you have two households and, and uh, two cars, <clears throat> etc. Um, and then a range of things that are um, natural capital uh, related. So the cost of air and water pollution and loss of wetlands and farmland, etc. Um, so <clears throat> this has been done for several countries, including the United States. And you get, this is a, a comparison of, uh, on, a, on an index scale, uh, where I think 1980 or so is, is 100, of GDP per capita is the blue, the blue line. GPI per capita is the red line. So it tracks GDP quite well until about 1980, and then has leveled off, even though GDP has gone up. And you can compare that with life satisfaction, which is also going down in the US. Uh, the Human Development Index going up slightly, the ecological footprint and biocapacity. Compare that with China and look over here at the numbers again. So, you know, for the U.S., GDP goes from 100 to maybe 170 over that time period. For China, it goes from 100 to 360. So GDP has been going through the roof in China per capita. <clears throat> GPI, what, again, was tracking it till about 1995 in this case and then has leveled off uh, since then. So increasing... Uh, income inequality in China, which is now as bad as it is in the United States, increasing air and water pollution. If you've been to Beijing or Shanghai recently, uh, you know what that's like. So that's sort of canceled out in terms of, of well-being, all of this growth in, in, uh, in GDP. Uh, we looked at 17 different countries for which uh, GPI has been estimated, and this is uh, Vicky's work, I think, on, on New Zealand, is this line. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, compared with Australia, which is a little bit higher and has been going up slightly, but many of the countries have the same pattern as, uh, as we saw in the U.S. data. We put all that together into a global GPI per capita versus global GDP per capita estimate, and it looks something like this, where we've gone from a period of economic growth uh, in the post-war World War II period till about 1980 or so, where the economy was growing, it was also improving well-being, to a period of what you might call uneconomic growth. The economy is growing, but it's not really improving well-being or welfare. So it's not really economic in that in that sense. So um, a couple of states in the U.S. have picked up this genuine progress indicator and are now using it to make their policy decisions. Uh, Maryland was the first state. If you look at their website, um, it's got a very good uh, description of all of the elements that go into GPI, um, where they got the data from, and also what sort of policies they're implementing to improve GPI rather than than GDP. There's also a little special on the uh, uh, public broadcasting system news hour about uh, uh, the problems with GDP and, and using GPI. Um, Vermont is a, a second state that incorporated GPI. In fact, they passed legislation that makes it a requirement now to estimate the genuine progress indicator every, every year. So, <clears throat> um, 
So building the future that we want uh, requires that we measure what we want. I think it's important that we begin to incorporate natural and social capital uh, into our assessments at many different scales, uh, you know, from individual policies uh, up to the national level. But we have to remember it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. Uh, so one justification for sticking to GDP is that we can measure it precisely, even though we can't really measure it that precisely if you get right down to it. Uh, but that's no excuse uh, for continuing to ignore the things that we can't measure as precisely, but we know are, are even more important uh, than the things that are included in GDP. Um, <clears throat> and to create this sustainable and desirable economy in society and nature requires that we break this addiction, and I, and I think of it very much as an addiction uh, to this growth at all costs economic paradigm, fossil fuels to over, overconsumption. Uh, the reason we haven't changed more quickly, I think, is that there are a lot of positive feedbacks in the short run, uh, even though there are long-term uh, costs and, and disbenefits. Uh, so how do, we, <clears throat> how, do we, how do we create the societal therapy uh, that's going to be required to make this transformation? And I think part of that has to do with envisioning a more sustainable and desirable future that focuses on quality of life. It's not a sacrifice uh, to, to, to make this transition. It's really a sacrifice not to. Uh, we are really uh, depleting our quality of life uh, by continuing down the, the business as usual path and we could create a more, uh, a higher quality of life uh, if we uh, shift to um, <clears throat> a, a system that's focused more on quality of life, that embraces the sustainable development goals as our, uh, as our, 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 uh, our countries have already agreed to, um, and that begins to implement uh, those, sorts of, those sorts of policies. So... <clears throat> Thank you, and I'll end it there.